speaking and where he's wanting to take us. And so I actually want us to go back this morning to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 1. Uh, if you remember, that's where we were last week. We talked about new territory. We talked about God taking us into new territory. God has so much more for us. We've got to realize that there's more to God than we've experienced. That, that God's going to increase the outpouring of His Spirit. Amen? Amen. And so, <clears throat> I want us to go back to Judges because I believe there's some more things the Lord wants to show us about moving into new territory. Judges chapter 1, I'm going to get, begin reading in verse 19. It says, The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had iron chariots. They were strong. As Moses had promised, Hebron was given to Caleb, and he drove from it the three sons of Anak. The Benjamites, however, failed to dislodge the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites live there with the Benjamites. Jump down to verse 27. But Manasseh did not drive out the people of Bethshan, or Tanakh, or Dor, or Iblium, or Megiddo, and their surrounding settlements. For the Canaanites, and that's enemies, that's the enemy, were determined to live in that land. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Nor did Ephraim uh, uh, drive out the Canaanites living in Jazir. But the Canaanites continued to live there among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in Kiltron or Nahalal who remained among them, but they did subject them to forced labor. Nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko or Sidon or Alab or Akzib or Helba or Aphek or Rehob. And because of this, the people of Asher lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land. Neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath. But the Naphtalites too lived among the Canaanites' inhabitants of the land. And those living in Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became forced laborers for them. The Amorites, that's another enemy. The Amorites confined the Danites to the hill country. Not allowing them, I hope you're catching some of this, not allowing them to come down into the plain. And the Amorites were determined also to hold on to Mount Heres, Ajalon, and Shelbim. But when the power of the house of Joseph increased, they too were pressed into forced labor. The boundary of the Amorites was from Scorpion Pass to Selah, and beyond. Now hang with me. I'm going to read a couple more verses. I want you to get this. Chapter 2. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bacham and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land. But you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? Now therefore I tell you that I will not drive them out before you. They will be thorns in your sides and their gods will be a snare to you. I want to talk today about no relent. This is the word of the Lord for us as we're in this new season of moving into new territory. God is taking us into new territory. Just like he was pay, taking their people then. His people then into new territory. And one of the main things that we see. As we study this passage. Uh, about moving into new territory. Is that there were enemies. Now they had physical enemies. Our enemies are different. But these enemies did not want to leave. They did not want to release 
this new territory. They did not want the people of God driving them out of the territory that they had claimed and possessed for so long. Verse 27, in fact, tells us that the Canaanites, who again was the enemy that occupied that territory, it had belonged to them for a long time, were determined to live in that land. Sometimes our enemy is stubborn. I said it last week that, that our enemy is not just going to step aside and say welcome and throw us a party because we're trying to step into new territory. Are you with me? The reason that God did not want these enemies to remain was because He knew that they would corrupt His people. That they would be a hindrance and a stumbling block to them. That these enemies needed to go. You cannot coexist with the enemy. There's enemies that we still face today and they cannot be allowed to stay because in verse 3 of chapter 2 tells us why they can't stay. They need to go because they will be thorns in your sides and their gods will be a snare to you. We've got to completely drive out all of these enemies. Amen? Now again, our enemies are different. They have different names than us. But ultimately, our enemy is Satan. And he's our adversary. And he has schemes and tactics that he uses. And things that he wants to put in our way that are going to hinder us and hold us back. An enemy is anything that hinders That anything that holds you back, anything that is a a stumbling block that keeps you from advancing into all of the territory that God has for you. That's an enemy. And they've got to go. In Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about our enemy. Again, their enemies were physical and their names all ended in ites. Our enemies are spiritual. We can't see them. In Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against, watch this, the devil's schemes. The devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil. I'm talking about a real enemy that doesn't want you to go into new territory and walk in new freedom. The spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. All the flaming arrows of the enemy that wants you to relent. He shoots arrows at us. He resists because he wants us to back up. He wants us to to relent. He uses several tactics to keep us from advancing. I'm getting to that here in just a minute. Verse 34 of our text, it says the Amorites, which was the enemy. I'm showing you what happens if you don't decide, I've got some enemies in my life that I need to drive out. It says the Amorites confined the Danites to the hill country, not allowing them to come down into the plains. Hear me now. This is what the enemy wants. He wants to confine us and he wants to stop us. He doesn't want us advancing and living in freedom. Listen, the only reason the people of God did not take full possession of their promise, the only reason the people of God were confined to less than all that they could have had, the only reason that the people of God did not enjoy complete freedom was because they relented. They relented. God said, all of this can be yours. There's some enemies, though, that you need to drive out. Here's what the word relent means. It means back down, give way, yield, ease off, let up, relax, diminish. I come today to tell us, church, that we're going to get a spirit of no relent. I'm asking God to put in us a spirit of no relent. That we will not back down, we will not let up, we will not diminish, we will not ease off, we will not stop. It is not time for us to relent. It's time for us to put on the gas, drive out the enemy, and take more territory. Are you with me? I want to show us today a few ways that the people of God then relented 
because I want us to learn from their mistakes and make sure that we don't relent in some of these same ways that they did. If you're with me, say amen. amen. First thing that, they see, that I see is that they relented by making excuses. They relented by making excuses. Look at verse 19. It says, The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because. Anytime you hear the word because, there's always an excuse behind it. They were unable to drive them out because they had chariots fitted with iron. Now I want you to notice that they did not relent because God wasn't with them. It plainly says that God was with them. That's not the reason that they relented. They did not relent because God wasn't able. They knew that God was able. They had seen how God was able. They relented because they ran into something strong. They relented because they ran into something difficult. They relented because they ran into a stubborn enemy. They relented because they thought the enemy was stronger than they were. They relented because they ran into something strong. Hang with me. God wants to speak something to us today. Instead of digging in their heels and calling on God and continuing to trust and obey Him, they just relented. How often do the people of God relent because? We relent because... I relent because I've tried before and I was unable. I'm relenting because what's the use? It's too strong. I'm relenting because fill in the blank. I'm relenting because it's just too hard. It's taking too long. It doesn't seem to be happening. The enemy's not making it easy. He's determined to stay. I don't seem strong enough. And the list continues to build until we relent. Is anybody hearing me today? It's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants you to think that he's stronger. He wants to intimidate you. He wants you to back off. He wants you to think that you can't defeat him because he's too strong. It's iron chariots. He wants you to think. He wants you to think, I can't drive out this anger because it's been there my whole life and it's an iron chariot. It's so strong. I can't, I can't drive out this anger. It's been a stronghold in my life all my life. I've always given in to it. And I've tried before to overcome it, but I can't drive it out. He wants you to think, I can't drive out this addiction. It's been there for 20 years and it's too strong. And I've tried before and couldn't, so why try again? It says they were unable. That leads me to think that they tried, but they didn't. They couldn't. They weren't able. How do you know you're not able unless you try? I can't completely drive out this unforgiveness and bitterness because it's been there for so long and it's become so strong. Such a stronghold in my life. I can't completely drive out this porn because it's been allowed to stay for all my life for so long. And it's an iron chariot. I can't get rid of it. I've tried before. The enemy wants you to think these things. And you allow addiction and lust and anger and unforgiveness and the list goes on and on and on and on and you allow it to stay because. God says, I want you to completely drive that out and you're relenting and allowing it to stay because. Because. Excuses. I can't completely drive out this critical spirit. It's too strong. Been that way my whole life. I can't completely drive out this pride. It's too strong. It's an iron chariot. I can't completely drive out this spirit of religion and self-righteousness. It's just too strong. The enemy wants you to think that whatever you come up against, whatever we come up against as a church, a spirit of religion, a spirit of pride, a critical spirit, a Jezebel spirit, a whatever kind of spirit, that we can't get it out of this place because it's too strong. He wants us to think it's too strong. And he wants us to relent. Some of you have strongholds in your life today. They've been there for a long time. That's why it's strong. That's why it's a stronghold, and it's determined to stay. I say, people of God, we got to get something in us that says, I'm determined to drive it out. I'm determined to drive it out. I'm, yeah, it doesn't belong here. This land doesn't belong to that enemy. God says, I can have this land. We've got to get a spirit of no relent and realize and believe that God is with us, that God is able, and that God will deliver, and we can completely drive out the enemy, and we will not relent. <laughs> Hear me today. We will not relent and then justify why we relented. Yes, right. Well, I relented because. 
You relented because you made some kind of an excuse. Because if you want it, I don't care how determined the enemy is. Greater is the one that's in us. He is stronger. He is with us. It says that the Lord was with the men of Judah. Why didn't they drive the enemy out? Because instead of looking at the Lord, they're looking at the iron chariots. Instead of standing on how strong our God is and how able our God is, they were, they were looking at how strong that addiction was, how strong that lust was, how strong that spirit was. Yes, there are some strong spirits. And there are some spirits that are going to be determined to stay. But we will not relent until any spirit that is not God's spirit is gone from this house and is gone from your life. We will not relent until a spirit of pride is gone. Until a spirit of religion is gone. No relent. Look over at your neighbor and say, no relent. Not going to let up. Not going to make excuses. Get rid of the word because. Unless it's to say I will because God is with me. I can because God is for me. And I, and I shall because God is stronger. But stop using an excuse after the word because. Use, an, use a declaration of faith after the word because. Come on somebody. The second thing that I see, they relented because of pride. Here you go again, Pastor. You know what? I'm going to keep hammering on it. And if you don't like it, it may be because you have a spirit of pride. But I'm going to keep hammering on it until pride is completely shattered and destroyed in this house. Watch me. Listen to this. Verse 28, it says, when Israel became strong. When Israel became strong. They should have been driving out the enemy. They should have been obeying the Lord's command. They were strong. But instead, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Was not the instruction to drive them out completely? The instruction was not to make slaves out of them. The instruction was get rid of them completely. However... They did something different. Hear me today. Here is, here's the root of pride. Here's the problem with pride. Pride says, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I have a different way. I know what the Lord said, but I've got a better way. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I think my way will work just as good. That's what pride says. And so... Here's another thing that pride says. Not only do I have a better way, a different way, my way will work. Pride tells you you can control it. Whatever it is that you can control that. You can keep it under control. Go ahead and let it stay. Just keep it under control. Go ahead and keep that drinking problem, but just keep it under control. Go ahead and keep that porn addiction, but just keep it under control. Go ahead and keep that anger, but just keep it under control. You can control it. Oh, this is what they did. Their enemies, instead of driving them out, they tried to control them. Pride says, you're in control. You got this. You don't have to listen to God. Just control it. Come on. Pride is all about control. That's why the Lord made me give him the keys to this church. I asked him the other day. I asked him the other day, Wednesday night, again, for I think the third week in a row, I've come in here with a word. I'm talking a fire word ready to preach. I know it's a word from the Lord. I want to share it. I think three Wednesday nights in a row, the Lord has not let me preach. We've totally gone in another direction. It's happened some on Sunday morning. I asked the Lord Thursday. I said, God, why won't you tell me ahead of time? Like, can you not, why, why won't you just tell me on Tuesday or Wednesday morning that, hey, you're not going to preach tonight. Here's what I'm going to do. He waits until we get in worship, and then I feel it so strong in my spirit, do this. Wednesday night, he had me go to four different people and have them share a testimony. And that was, our, that was the message. You heard four sermons, and it was powerful. It was wonderful. But I'm like, why didn't you, why didn't you like, 
make me think of that ahead of time, give them some head up, and like I could have organized it. He said, that's why. Because if I tell you too much ahead of time, you've got time to manipulate it and control it. He said, I'm teaching you to flow with me and not be in control, me be in control. The Lord's working on your pastor too, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I can control it. Pride wants you to think that you can control it. Pride wants you to think that it's not that important that you do things exactly as God instructs. Pride blinds you to the effects and consequences of what you're allowing. Pride is a tool and a trick of the enemy for you to allow him to stick around. It's, it's a tool. It's a trick. It's a scheme. It's a tactic for you to allow him to stay in the land. Allow me to stay and, and I promise you can control me. You're not in control. You ain't controlling that. It's controlling you. You think you're in control, but you're nothing but a slave. You're nothing but a slave. If you've got to have it, you can't live without it. Are you controlling it or is it controlling you? I got to have it. I can't live without it. I got to look at it. I got to drink it. I got to taste it. I got to see it. I got I to gotta, I gotta smoke it. I got to. You're not controlling anything. You're not controlling anything. I said, you're not controlling anything. You are being controlled by the enemy that you are supposed to be driving out. But pride says, go ahead and go to church. Nobody knows. Go ahead and worship. Nobody knows. Go ahead and live with it. You got it under control. It's not that bad. Mm. Pride. I say God keep hammering until pride is gone. I'm telling you God hates pride. That's why he keeps bringing it up in every sermon, just about every sermon that I preach. Keep hammering on it. What I tell you, he's remodeling the house. Some things have got to go. There's some enemies that's got to go, and God's going to keep hammering on it until it comes down. And I'm going to keep hammering on it until it comes down. And we're going to keep pounding on pride until it comes down. We're going to keep hammering. Pride wants you to make excuses. Well, I, I, I can't really be free in worship because... <laughs> well, I'm not, I can't really like act like that because I'm too cool for one. <laughs> <laughs> I started to tell somebody the other day, just joking around, that I used to be cool. And I'm like, no, I'm not, no, I've never been cool. <laughs> so why try to be cool now? Who am I trying to be cool? Am I trying to impress you or am I trying to please God? Am I going after you or God? Like, like what's, going, what's happening here? So laugh if you want to. No skin off my back. Pride. Pride is a root. It's got to go. We will not relent until pride is gone from this house. Listen to me. I don't care if I've got to talk about it every service. We will not relent until a spirit of pride. I rebuke a spirit of pride in this house. Pride. That, think that, that, that is causing you to think that you're in control and you can be in control and you can control whatever enemy God's wanting us to get rid of or wanting you to get rid of. Pride is it's a downfall. You give in to pride, it leads to nothing but downfall, nothing but destruction. Those enemies will eventually overtake you. The whole time lying to you, you got control of this. You got control of this pill addiction. You got control. You're in control. Are you really? Are you really? Stop and think about it. Who's being controlled? I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. I'll come back to it another time, though. Listen, you know why? The spirit of pride, it's at the top of the list of things God hates. 
It's one of the number one tools of the devil. Brought a lot of people down. Destruction. It's got to go. We're going to keep hammering on it till it's gone. Amen. 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 Pride is one of those enemies that's determined to stay. And I just declare again, pride, you got to go in the name of Jesus. Spirit of pride, you got to go. Matter of fact, just join with me right now. And just say, pride, pride. leave in the name of Jesus. Pride, pride. you got to go. I don't care how determined you are to stay. You got to go. Because pride is an enemy. And if it's an enemy, it's got to go. Pride hinders. Anything that hinders, it's got to go. Move on, Pastor. Here's the third thing that I see. You still with me? Say amen. amen. Here's the third thing that I see. They relented by compromise. Verse 2 of chapter 2, he says, You shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars, yet you have disobeyed me. You've made a covenant with them. You've allowed their altars to stay. What's he saying? Don't come into agreement with the enemy. You can't make agreements with the enemy. Instead, tear down anything that would corrupt you. Tear it down. Get rid of it. Destroy it. Get it out of your life. Compromise is when we go along with the enemy instead of resisting him. Compromise is when you go along with the enemy and you allow things that are from the enemy instead of resisting. The Bible tells us to resist him, standing strong in the faith. Amen? We need to be coming against him. The Bible tells us that our weapons are mighty to pull down strongholds of the enemy. Hear me today. You cannot be friends with these enemies. I heard a pastor testifying one time, and he was struggling with something. Even after he was a pastor, I've heard him share this a couple of times. And he said, Lord, I don't know why I'm still struggling with this, because you promised me that you would make my, you would make my enemies a footstool. And he said, I, he said, I kept going to God with that. Lord, you promised that you'd make an in, my enemies a footstool. And he said, the Lord spoke to me one day and said, it's not an enemy. You like it. You've snuggled up with it and allowed it to stay. It's not an enemy. When it becomes an enemy, it'll be under your feet. Hear me, somebody. When it becomes an enemy, when it becomes an enemy... You'll stop, you'll stop sleeping with it. You'll stop collaborating with it. You'll stop negotiating with it. You don't negotiate with enemies. You destroy enemies. You don't invite enemies into your house. You destroy enemies. You don't become friends with enemies. You destroy enemies. Hear me, somebody. The reason some things are staying in your life that need to go and it's hindering you is because you've cuddled up to it. You've cuddled up to it, and I can't live without it. I can't live without this alcohol. I can't live without this, this tobacco. I can't live without these pills. I can't live without this. And it's not an enemy. You don't see it as an enemy. Because when it really becomes an enemy, you'll destroy it. Hear me today. When it becomes an enemy, you'll drive it out. We drive enemies out. We don't become buddies with them. Stop being buddies with the enemy that's trying to destroy you. God, I'm preaching as hard as I know how. Still with me? Only got like 10 or 12 more to go. Why do y'all laugh when I say that? No, I'm joking. But I do have a few more. Here's the next thing. I think we're on number four. Yes. They relented because of comparison. Yeah. They relented because of comparison. It struck, it, 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 stuck, it struck me. It jumped out to me as I was reading this and studying it. It says, Manasseh did not drive out. Neither did Zebulun drive out. Nor did Asher drive out. 
Neither did Naphtali drive out. I hope you're tracking with me. I wonder if Zebulun relented because Manasseh did. I wonder if Asher relented because Zebulun did. And on and on down the line. I wonder if they had this thought of, well, Manasseh is like, Manasseh's older than me. Manasseh's stronger than me. So if he can't, I don't know why I can. If he couldn't, I don't know what makes me think that I should try. And, and if, if they're not, and they're older and wiser and stronger than me, but they're allowing enemies, then I don't know what makes me think that, that I can get rid of enemies. And it was their comparison with one another that caused them to allow enemies. Well, they're not, so if they're not, I won't. And well, well, hey, my enemy is not confining me to the hill country like theirs is. My enemy is not as controlling as theirs is, so I'm better than them. I've got more territory. I got more land than they do. So I'm better than them, so I'm just going to be satisfied with where I'm at because I'm doing better than they are. Are you seeing this? It just trickled down. This person didn't, so this person didn't, and then this person didn't, and then that person didn't. The only person that did was Caleb. God give us a Caleb spirit. That all the way back, way long time ago, when 12 spies were sent in, he was, he was, he was one of the two of the 10, of the 12. I totally just confused you. There was two that said, we can go and take it. Caleb was one of them. There was 10 that started talking doubt and defeat and all of that. So Caleb has always been this guy that said, I don't care what other people are saying, I know what my God's capable of. Yeah. Caleb was one of those, I don't care if Naphtali's not, I don't care if Zebulun's not, I don't care if Manasseh's not, I'm taking my land. Yeah. And it said that he drove the inhabitants of Anak off of his land. He got the enemies off of his land because he wasn't looking around seeing what everybody was or wasn't doing. He just said, I got some enemies on my land that I'm going to get off of my land and I don't care if Benjamin's not, I'm going to. Yeah. <laughs> Benjamin, Benjamin, read your Bible. Benjamin should have been looking at Caleb instead of Manasseh. Yeah, yeah. Some of these names. Yeah. Yeah. This is where we're at, church. Stop looking at someone else and comparing yeah. your spirituality with them. Yeah. Is there an enemy in your life? Then you only need to be looking at you, bud. Yeah. You only need to be looking at you. You need to be worrying about your enemies, your hill, getting your land, your territory. And then, 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 then. I love Caleb. Caleb's my, Caleb's my bro. Caleb's my dude. But Caleb, because he was one of them that had the faith and determination to get rid of the, He should have went over and helped Benjamin. Come on, Ben. I see you got some enemies you're trying to... Come on, let me encourage you. I'll help you. Let's get those enemies off there together. I'll hold you accountable. Come on, let's don't relent. Don't stop. Come on, we can do this. If I drove them off my land, we can drive them off your land too. Come on. If I, <laughs> that's what should have been happening. And old Benjamin, old Benjamin should have been going to Caleb and saying, Hey, I see you got victory in your life. I see you're walking in freedom. I see you're enjoying more territory than I am. Bro, can you help me? Will you come over here? I got some enemies. I got some enemies. I need you because you're a man of God. I need you to drive them. Help me drive them off. Help me drive them off. But we let comparison. I'm okay. I got enough. This is exactly what the enemy wants you to think. Hear me. Back off. I'm going to get ahead of myself. Comparison. Comparison, it's an enemy. Hmm. Don't say you can't just because others aren't. And don't relent just because others are. I have made up my mind by the grace of God. I don't care who in this church decides they're going to relent and quit and fall back. I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on. I've crossed a line. I've crossed a line that I'm not, I'm not crossing back over. And I've got something in my spirit. And the Lord is saying, don't relent. Don't relent. Don't relent. The enemy may be strong. Breakthrough may be a little bit difficult. But don't relent. 
Don't relent. You drive those enemies out of this place. Here's the next thing. Hang with me. Hang tight. They relented because of intimidation. They relented because of intimidation twice. It speaks of how their enemies were determined to remain. I love that it uses those in, that, that term determined. They were stubborn. You're not going to get rid of me. The enemy operates through intimidation, fear tactics. We've got to get a resolve that no matter how determined the enemy may be, God is greater and I will not relent. I'll just be more determined. If I got to fast more, I'll fast more. If I got to pray more, I'll pray more. If I got to worship harder, I'll worship harder. But I will not relent. Greater is he who's in me. Amen. The enemy wants you to think that you can. He wants you to think that it's useless. My Bible tells me that God's not given us this kind of spirit. That he's not given us a spirit of intimidation, a spirit of timidity, a spirit of fear. But he's given us a spirit of power. Church, it's time to go on the offensive. Instead of just playing defense, it's time to go on the offensive. And say, I will not be intimidated by the enemy. I will not be intimidated by man. And man that's being used by spirits to intimidate me. I will not be intimidated any longer. I know who I am. I know whose I am. I know what the word says. And I know where God has taken us. And I declare... Intimidation is done with. This man of God right here will no longer be intimidated and allow the enemy to cause me to be afraid of what man thinks, what people are or aren't doing, what they may be saying behind my back, criticism. I made up my mind. I don't care how determined the enemies are. Greater is he that's in me. My weapons are mighty. We're going to link arms together. And we're going to drive out all the enemies. Until there's complete victory. Until there's complete breakthrough. Until there's complete freedom. We're going to keep driving the enemy out. Because God's given us that kind of spirit. Not of timidity. Not of intimidation. But of power. And love. And discipline. All right, a couple more. I'm finished. I'll go through them quickly. I don't want you to get done before I do. But if, you, if you're not listening, pinch, your, pinch yourself real fast. Wake up. I want you to get this. They relented because of laziness. They relented because of laziness. Now, bear with me. I'm taking some liberty. Because scripture doesn't just come out and say this, but sometimes you have to think about it and look at it and infer some things. Sometimes, a lot of times, it's easier not to. We relent a lot of times because fighting is tough. Pressing in is hard. Driving enemies out completely takes a lot of effort. Overcoming requires work. I think a lot of times the people of God relent. And it's very possible in their case that they relented just because we just don't feel like it. We just don't feel like it. We just don't want to. It's too hard. It's easier not to. It's easier to just put up with it than to try to, try to go through the fight of getting rid of it. It's easier to just tolerate it. That's exactly what the enemy wants. Are you hearing me today? Too many times people of God endure things they don't have to endure and put up with enemies that they don't have to put up with and lack of freedom and a victory that they could have simply because of laziness. Prayer is work. Fasting is tough. Study is difficult. Worship takes a lot of effort. Pressing in Requires a lot of intentionality. It's easier not to. It's easier to sit. It's easier to not open my mouth. 
it's easier to not stir up the enemy and having him attacking me from every which way. It's easier to just back up, let up, so that I don't have to feel all of that and fight through all of that oppression and attack of the enemy. Come on, somebody. And it's nothing but spiritual laziness that causes us to relent. Back up, back off, let up. Don't pray as much. Sure to God, don't fast. That's way too difficult. Get, don't read your Bible. Don't you dare get into worship. Those people are fanatical. You don't have to be that fanatical. That's stupid. And we don't because it's easier not to. Yeah, it's easier to not lift your hands. Yeah, it's easier to not open your mouth and sing. Yeah, it's easier to not dance. God Almighty, it's easier to not fast. That's what we think. That's what the enemy wants us to think. It's easier not to. But I come today with another way of looking at this thing. Is it really easier not to? Or is it easier to go ahead and put your battle gear on and fight through to victory and freedom and then enjoy the fruit of the land? Don't that sound easier than having to always deal with the enemy and them always being a thorn in your side and a snare to your walk? Always looking over your shoulder. Always making you feel bad because you know they need to go, but you've allowed them to stay. Always suppressing you. Always confining you to the hill country. And you've got to look down there at all that green grass, but you can't go enjoy any of it because the enemies confined you to the hill country and you're too lazy to march yourself down the hill and say, this is my territory. Honest to goodness, I see it all the time. Just too lazy. I don't want to pray. I don't want to worship. I don't want to read. I don't want to study. I don't want to press in. I don't want to be faithful. I don't want to get up early. I don't want to fast. You know what all that is? I, 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 I I don't want to. And you got to say, flesh, shut up. Shut up, flesh. Shut up, flesh. Are we not supposed to be killing the flesh? It's the flesh that says don't pray. Listen, laziness, laziness. I'm going to go ahead and just stomp on some toes. This is why Jesus was sweating blood in the garden and the disciples were sleeping. He was warring in his spirit and they were giving in to their flesh. We don't feel like praying. We're too tired to pray. We don't really understand the spiritual what's going on in the heavenlies right now. And so we're just going to sleep. Church, you better wake up and realize what's happening. What's happened in the spirit world. And you better get something in your spirit. You better get a fight that says, I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to let up. I don't care what my flesh is saying. I know fasting is tough. I know I may look ridiculous jumping up and down. Pastor, can't you do anything else besides jump up and down? Mind your business and get your own dance. I'm going to jump up and down. At least, at least, at least your pastor is not too lazy to worship. And I will not. I will not. Let my kids out worship me. Come on, man of God. That'd be like your teenage boy working harder than you. Shame on you. If your teenage boy's got more work ethic than you do. Our superintendent, my boss, I've been in some services with him. Your superintendent... Guess what he does? And claps and shouts and raises. You know why? I've heard him say it more than once. Y'all will not out-worship me. I will not be out-worshipped. God, give us some of that. That we get something in and says, you know what? I'm not going to be out-worshipped. 
I'm not gonna, you're not going to sing louder than me. You're not going to clap. You're not going to jump higher than me. I love it Sunday night and our Activate night. That Caleb, my Caleb, and Big Rig were up here trying to see who could jump the highest. I asked Caleb later, I said, who jumped higher? He goes, oh, me, easy. He said, he said Garrett's getting old. He said, the only reason it looked like he was jumping higher than me is because he's so big. He is a high jump record holder. Yeah. Caleb, not Garrett. <laughs> I love you. I love you dearly. And I'm trying to be a father to this house and pastor you. Church, too many of us are too lazy. If you don't ever fast, if you spend very little time in prayer, if you refuse to engage in worship, if you won't just do anything extra more than the absolute bare minimum, you are spiritually lazy. And there's no room for that. The enemy will run roughshod over you when you're lazy. Because guess what? The enemy doesn't relent. The enemy doesn't relent. And guess what? The enemy is not lazy. He's very smart. He's very strategic. I'm not trying to give too much credit to the enemy, but I'm trying to wake us up to the fact that the Bible says he's like a lion. Last time I checked, lions were very strong, very clever. That's why he said, you better be alert, boy. You better wake up. You can't be lazy. You got to be sober and vigilant, diligent, because you got an adversary that's not just trying to take you out. I think he's, I'm not going to say that. I don't want to sound prideful. If he can't get you, he'll try to get people in your house. I'm not just responsible for protecting me from the schemes of the enemy. I'm rep- responsible to stand in front of Kay, uh, Colt, my 11-year-old, that, that doesn't know up from down yet. He doesn't know, come here from Sikkim. I don't even know what that means. I just heard Brother Moore say it. <laughs> and it sounded good. <laughs> if I get lazy, the line's going to get my kids. Do you want to be the kind of father that the lion gets your kids? Do you want to be that guy? And the reason the lion got his kids because he's asleep. We should have been awake. The reason the lion got his kids because he was drunk. We should have been sober. He didn't drive the enemy out. If you don't drive the enemy out, at some point, somebody's got to drive the enemy out. Because if you don't, it's going to be the same enemy for your kids. As sad, it broke my heart. I was fighting back tears as I watched it. But that Presley girl... Y'all saw that on the news the other day? Passed away. Elvis Presley's daughter. Overdosed. Well, what happened to Elvis? Overdosed. What happened to her? Overdosed. What happened to her son? Committed suicide. These things run in families. At some point, somebody's got to chop the head of the snake off. At some point, somebody has got to say, this enemy, this enemy... This addiction, this, this stronghold stops with me. This stronghold stops with me. I know that my father was like that and my grandfather was like that, but it stops with me. Can't be lazy. Can't be lazy. Can't be lazy. All right, I'm finishing. We did good today. We went past 12. 
Thank you, Lord. It's my goal every week. <laughs> I'm serious. And don't you dare leave when I call for the altar. Because some of you need to be here. I'm feeling it today. I know I am. Don't make a beeline for the door when I call for the altar. Whatever's out there can wait. This is more important. All right. Let me, let me spin the table a little bit. Let me help you. I think they relented. And again, the Bible doesn't say this. I'm inferring some things. But I think maybe they relented because of weariness. It took us so much to get just to this point. We had to fight so hard and overcome so much. We're finally in the promised land. Like, we're in the promised land. So, like, let's just let good enough be good enough. Because I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of, I'm tired of pressing. I'm, I'm, I've, I've prayed and I've prayed and, and, it's, and, I've, and, I've, and I've moved forward and, I'm, and I've advanced. And I, it's got me here. I'm in the promised land. And I just, oh, I just want to, I just want to relent. I just want to take a break. I just want to take a break. Man, I've been through so much. The enemies hit me so hard. It took us so much to get to right here. Can I not just, can I not just take a breather? Can we not just relax and just let up for a little bit? Do we have to be this serious and this intense? And the enemy will use weariness. To get you to just sit down and say, you know what? We, we, this is pretty good. This is pretty good. Look at this. Yeah, we've been through some tough stuff. And man, I've had to fight like the Dickens. But this, look at this. This is pretty good. This is pretty good. I think I'll just be satisfied. Are you hearing me today, church? Just be satisfied with what territory you have. Weariness. I'm telling you, it's a tool of the enemy to get the people of God to relent. To make us feel good about how far we've come and where we're at, and it's good enough. Just back off. It's good enough. My Bible tells me, and listen, I understand weariness. I've been there a time or two myself. True, legit weariness. I've been to the point of depression before because I've allowed the enemy to get to me in ways that I shouldn't have allowed him to get to me through discouragement and through my priorities being wrong. You can get wore out doing the work of the Lord and run off and leave the Lord of the work and you're running in your own strength and running on adrenaline. I've been there and you crash and burn. I understand weariness. But I do also know that the Bible says don't be weary in well-doing. I do also know that God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. <clears throat> if you get to rely on your own strength, you will get weak and weary. But the Bible says those who wait on the Lord will what? Renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. Chances are, if you're weary this morning, you have done some of, if not all of, the same things that I did when I got weary several years ago to the point that all I thought about was quitting. All I wanted to do was quit. That's all I, that's all I thought. I just wanted to quit. If I could just quit for at least a month, I felt like I'd be all right. But it was because I was running in my own strength instead of waiting on the Lord. The Lord told me even at the beginning of this year, He said, if you'll truly, truly make me first in every aspect of your life, he said, I'll renew your strength and restore your joy. And ministry will not be a job. It'll be a joy. It'll be a delight. It'll be easy. A yoke is easy. My burden is light. It doesn't mean that we don't battle. It doesn't mean that there's not conflict. It doesn't mean that there's not... In, but, but you have a strength because you're running to Him for His grace and relying on His grace, which is His power, instead of trying to plow ahead in your own strength and determination. 
you got to wait on the Lord. That's why I said don't leave when I call for this altar. Because if you're weary, the thing that you need the most is to get into the presence and wait on the Lord and let Him renew your strength. And He will. And He will. Your pastor, this was several years ago. I started changing my priorities. And God started... Healing and restoring, and it was a process. But look at me now. I feel stronger than ever. Not in my own ability, but because I'm spending time with the Lord. In His presence, in His Word. Running to Him for grace. Running to Him for anointing and wisdom. Running to Him. Running to Him. Waiting on Him. Amen? That's where it's at. That is where it's at. I'm not trying to act like I'm something special. You can have this too. You can have this too. You can do this too. He loves you almost as much as he does me. I kid. No relent. Stand stand with me. Please don't leave unless unless you just absolutely have to. But I would imagine, I think I covered, what I cover, seven things today. No excuses. Listen, we got to be done with excuses. I can't because. I won't because. I don't because. Get rid of excuses. Hello? No pride. Pride says hang on to it, but just control it. No. God says drive it out. Hello, somebody? No compromise. I'm not negotiating with the enemy. I'm not buddying up to the enemy. It's an enemy. It's got to go. Enemies are meant to be destroyed. It's got to go. And today is the day. It's controlled me long enough. It's hung around long enough. Today I'm ready to get rid of it. No more comparison. Listen to me here in a moment. You're going to be tempted to compare. You're going to be tempted to compare. Well, I'm the only one going to the altar. Or there's just a couple of us. What are people? Stop comparing. If you've got an enemy, you get the enemy off your land and let that everybody else worry about the enemies on their land. I promise you, there's a bunch of enemies in this room. And today is the day that they go. Hear me. Today is the day that they go. I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm not going to let the enemy intimidate me. Well, you've tried before and it didn't happen. You've been prayed for before. You've tried to quit before and it didn't happen. Hear me. No laziness. If I know I need to move, I'm going to move. I'm not going to sit back because it's easier. It's easier than trying to deal with this. (laughs) You can deal with it now and get rid of it, or you can just keep dealing with it, which is easier. You can go ahead and deal with it and get it out, or you can keep dealing with it. And I think... Just dealing with it now is easier than continuing to deal with it. Hello, somebody? No relent. No more weariness. I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to get my priorities right. I'm going to let Him renew my strength. Come on. I, I I covered a large area today. Bottom line, bottom line, and I want you to come to the altar. Anything in your life that is a hindrance, it's holding you back, it's a stumbling block, it's a thorn in your flesh, you want it gone, you know it's not of God, it's got to leave, I want you to come now and stand across the front, come on, begin to move, right, don't wait on somebody else, don't even look around, I got an enemy, I want you to stand across the front, I got an enemy, it's, it's, it's stolen from me, it has tried to control me, I, it's, it's got to be gone, In the name of Jesus, come on. Doesn't matter what it is. And it doesn't matter how strong it's been. It doesn't matter if it seems like it's, well, it's got, it's an iron chariot. So what? Was the Lord with them or not? Oh, I love all the young people up here today. Come on, I want some people, some of my prayer team, that you've gotten some victory over some things. You've gotten some victory over some things. You've overcome some spiritual laziness. You've fought through some things and driven off some enemies. I want you to get up here and help me pray. 
especially for these young people. Especially for these young people. Listen, Benjamin was the youngest. Listen to me. Benjamin was the youngest tribe. He was the youngest child of Israel. Somebody should have been helping Benjamin get his enemies off his land. Instead of saying, you can fight for yourself. Some of them don't know how to fight. They don't know how to fight. They need you to fight for them and teach them how to fight. Come on. Come on. We're going to let Judah lead the way. We're going to let Judah lead the way. Come on. The Lord told me yesterday. He said, I want to heal. I want to save. I want to deliver. I want to restore. I want to revive. I want to everything. I want to do it all. And I'm just getting started. Come on. Begin to worship him. Just say, Lord, I believe you're with me. Come on. Lift your hands. Say, Lord, I believe you're with me. The Bible says that the Lord was with the men of Judah. The Lord was with the people of praise. He was with the people of praise. And Lord, I look out and I see these iron chariots. But Lord, there's no match for you. There's no match for you. And I hear what the enemies tried to tell me. That this has been here for so long. There's no way you can get rid of it. But I come today, I come today to dance on the plans of the enemy. I come today to declare war. I come today to say I will not relent until these enemies are gone. I come today to say this is my territory. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, every stronghold be broken. Ha! In the name of Jesus, every stronghold of the enemy come down by the power of the Holy Spirit. Every addiction be broken. Every enemy you have to flee. Ha! You enemy of porn that has crept in and corrupted our kids, you got to go in the name of Jesus. You spirit of pride, you got to go in the name of Jesus. Come on. I want you to start praying for somebody. Start praying with somebody. Listen. Say, I'm going to help you get your enemies off your territory. And then I want you to help me get my enemies off my territory. Because this is my territory. Enemy, Satan, adversary, you can't have our young people. Come on, why are you laying back? Why are you being quiet? Don't be lazy. Don't be intimidated. Come on, people of God. Let you to lead the way. Hey! No relent. No relent. In the name of Jesus. Ha. I declare healing in the house today. I declare healing. Today. I declare healing in the house today. In the name of Jesus. Ha! Come on, get a fight in your spirit. Get a fight in your spirit. Come on. Listen, the enemy is not quiet. He's stubborn. It says that they were determined to stay. The people of God has got to get a determination that the enemy cannot stay. Come on, people of God. Warfare is not quiet. Warfare is not quiet. Hey. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes. Come on, take authority. Take authority. It's got to go. You got 
got to go in the name of Jesus. One, two, three. Call it out. Tell it it's got to go. Come on, tell it it's got to go. by the power of darkness. We are children of the light. Oh God. God. Do it today. Do it today. Drive out the enemy once and for all. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hey. Come on church. Come on you Praying, you need to be worshiping. Come on, somebody. 